Hi. Every guy has their favorite era of history. Like, you got your World War II buffs, the Civil War enthusiasts, maybe you love the Medieval Era, or Shogun Japan. And we all know how often men think about ancient Rome. If you're an American, then there's a general idea for how Western history is kind of gone. Let me know if this sounds familiar. First, just start off with Ancient Egypt, or Greece, then Rome. Move on to the Fall of Rome, then the Dark Ages, maybe some Vikings. Next are medieval times, then the Renaissance, and then on to Columbus, then the Pilgrims, all culminating with the Founders and the start of real history, which is of course, the United States. We're the main characters of the world, baby! You could say there's a little historical blind spot, but that's kind of the general way world history is sort of viewed. Whatever the era happens to be, there's some general idea or stereotype about what that period was all about. But I'm here today to tell you about a time period that nobody ever thinks about. It's, uh, it's this one. The period between the 1500s and early 1700s is, in my opinion, the most underrated era in Western history, especially in the United States. Now, my claims have no actual statistical basis. Uh, I'm not gonna cite a source on this. It's just kind of a vibe I get. It's my channel. I, I get to say what I want. From my obtuse and very scientific observations, there's only like three things your average American might vaguely know of this era. One, the Renaissance. This is the Renaissance. But well, that's kind of a limited term. You know, that term makes you think of art and culture and the masters. Really just anything with Italy. The second in the English-speaking world is usually like Shakespeare. Shakespeare in the Elizabethan era was like late 1500s, early 1600s. And in public education, you only hear about Shakespeare in high school English. Imagine future people only knowing about today because of the pop culture of our time. There is one major thing Americans know about this era. One that is just kind of drilled into you at a young age. And you know what it is. Pilgrims. F***ing pilgrims. And Thanksgiving. And Pocahontas. Anything after Columbus and before the Revolution can really just be lumped together into this vague category of pilgrims. What's kind of funny is that, in public education at least, the 1500s to early 1700s is kind of in this weird limbo. Like, you just stop learning about anything that goes on in Europe once the pilgrims actually come over here. Literally anything else across the pond is just never mentioned until the French Revolution. But back in Europe, like, things were still happening. A lot was happening. <laughs> The term for this period is the Early Modern Period. It's not the most attractive name, but uh, it's pretty accurate to what it was. This was a transition period, when the medieval world changed into one that created the conditions for what we would call modern Europe. Wars lasted 30 years, fashion looked like this, borders looked like that, and the medieval world clashed and adapted to new technologies that were never seen before. Gunpowder, cannons, muskets. That's a whole lot of words just to say, I like the knights with guns. This era was dominated by what is now called pike and shot warfare. You know ancient Greece? You know how they used the phalanx? That was the unstoppable tactic of its day. Before the Romans put a swift end to all of that, Poor predictable pranks. Always takes phalanx. Good old phalanx. Nothing beats that. Afterwards, using big spears was kind of out of fashion through the Empire era to medieval times. All until the Swiss began to form up in a square with pikes. Technically, the Scottish thought of it first, but that didn't really end up well for them. The pike square was a solution to a problem, and that problem was the horse. Throughout the medieval era, cavalry had been dominant on the battlefield, with infantry lacking any real means to defend against it. That was, until the Pike Square. Bunch of soldiers, very little training, take a big ol' stick and put it out in front. Spain's empire, in part, was built from dominating with the Pike and Shot, as they introduced the Shot. Musketeers on the flanks of the square that could give the formation some ranged attack, and also would retreat inside the square when need be. And I absolutely love the muskets at this specific time. At first, they weren't even technically muskets. The early muskets required a stick to aim and a wick to fire, as it was too unwieldy to prepare and aim with two hands. 
This was gunpowder warfare in its absolute infancy, a technology so young that it was seen as black magic by its contemporaries. Didn't really help their case that they had their own guilds and protected their secrets. So yeah, they, they did kind of look suspicious. This period's so neat to me because while guns do still exist, tactics are still with swords and spears. Calvary, for some reason, decided to adopt guns too. Uh, so for a brief while, Calvary no longer did the whole charge thing. It would just circle outside the Pike Square and shoot occasionally with pistols and blunderbusses, which is just kind of hilarious. This is like if you just clashed together a bunch of unrelated tactics and technologies. Pike formations like the Greek phalanx, guns that were crafted by hand and treated as specialists, and cavalry that shot using pistols in full armor. Technically not knights, but it's close enough. And this is why Warhammer Fantasy has a superior aesthetic to 40k. That's right, I said it. Even if you have never seen these factions, you probably know what they're all about. The Empire might as well have Holy Romans slapped in front of it, because that's what it is. Kislev is basically just Eastern Europe, winged hussars and all, and don't get me started on the vampire counts. Ironically, there is a faction I could accurately describe as true medieval, with knights and lances, and the absolute absence of gunpowder. And that's Bretonia. Bretonia f***ing sucks. For me personally, I've kind of lost interest in the standard medieval era. Maybe I've just been overexposed to it, but I don't know, lately I've just been drawn to this more. At the end of the day, you know, I like both, but uh, one side has really goofy hats, and, and I like goofy hats. Now I think about it, you know, it's kind of uh, tasteless to say that certain wars were neat and cool, considering a lot of people died. But I don't know, what's the rule on that? After a few centuries, I think you can say that, right? It's fascinating, at least. Fascinating because Pike and Shot was just this anomaly in warfare. It can't really be compared to anything else. The states we're familiar with in many parts did exist, assuming you weren't in the Balkans, I guess. And what's cool about that is a lot of countries that aren't the strongest today were at some point in this era an absolute powerhouse. Like Poland-Lithuania. Look at that. Poland-Lithuania dominated the East. The Winged Hussars were the military force on the battlefield, even while cavalry in the West was losing significance. Ironically, Poland was the terror to Russia, which was coming out of its own time of troubles. And for a century there, another major power in the East was Sweden. Despite their lower population, Sweden had turned the Baltic Sea into a Baltic lake, all thanks to the tactical genius of warrior kings like Charles XII and Gustavus Adolphus. It took a coalition of Poland, Russia, and Austria to bring them down. Funnily enough, Charles would hide out in Ottoman territory once the war turned against him. Oh yeah, the Ottomans. This era was the golden age for the Ottomans. In a way, they brought on its beginning with the fall of Constantinople, and their decline didn't really begin until the late 1600s after the Battle of Vienna, though that's debatable. In a time when the Spanish were colonizing the world and France was solidifying its kingdom, the Balkans just remained under Ottoman control, unable to gain independence until the 19th century. And it makes sense why. I mean, look at that. In the 17th century, the Ottomans controlled land from Vienna to the Persian Gulf, and from Mecca to Tunisia. Almost half of the Mediterranean and pretty much the entire Black Sea were either tributaries or directly in their control. It really is insane that there was even a Battle of Vienna to begin with, when you just remember where Vienna was on a map. Even crazier that it was the second time. The Austrian Habsburg rivalry with the Ottomans was really something. Like, in the span of 250 years, they fought like 14 wars. Which in hindsight is actually quite ironic considering how the two would fight side by side with one another in their very last war. It's kind of poetic. Speaking of potentially the last war, Ukraine. What we think of as Ukraine during this time was controlled by, well, nobody. Well, technically Poland, but it was just on a map. This was an actual no-man's land in Europe. The collapse of the Golden Horde centuries before created a power vacuum. The flat plains were roamed by Crimean Tatars, who frequently raided Slavic lands to enslave and plunder. This only got worse with aid from the Ottomans, considering the Ottomans were buying those slaves. 
This land was simply called the Wild Fields for a time. A vast plain of grasslands ruled by nobody, settled by nobody, where the only people that would venture into this land were tough settlers, nomads, or criminals who wished to get away from jurisdiction. Sound familiar? This is where we got the Cossacks. I just find it fascinating that a part of Europe was unsettled for so long that a lot of the settlements there are just as young as cities in the United States. Hey, speaking of dysfunctional states, the Holy Roman Empire. The HRE gets made fun of a lot, and yeah, I get it. It was a mess. Just an absolute mess. But those flaws are why I love it. Like how people love the deformed, squished face of a pug. All of this was just divided into assorted lands between minor lords, major lords, independent cities, grand duchies. It was horrible, but it somehow lasted a thousand years. Germany in general was just the worst place to be during this time. Like we had the Thirty Years' War, Protestant Reformation, General Famine, Soldiers committed vast war crimes, dressed like this. It was a wild time. Charles V is kind of the embodiment of this entire era. He was the sovereign over territory that we can't even fathom today being a part of the same region or government. And for the most part, the largest wars were fought with paid mercenaries. The very concept of a professional soldier was kind of strange. Mercenaries had always existed, but they were on the sidelines. But now, an average man could be paid to be a soldier as a career, without being a lord or owning any land. And that had ethical questions. Like, at least in the US, being a soldier is seen as a whole thing. But in times like the Thirty Years' War, a soldier was someone paid by your local lord just to protect his interests. Even if those interests were aligned with yours religiously, like being a Catholic, the fighters themselves were still distrusted, and not really liked. This is probably because if the Lord didn't pay them, they'd rampage through the countryside. This was a transition period. There were still kinks to figure out. Too bad the Holy Roman Empire never figured out those problems. So yeah, in this era, we saw the Swedes, the Poles, the Spanish, and the Turks all at their height. And really, the ones who would come to dominate the coming centuries were still getting things figured out. Hell, England executed their king and didn't have one for a decade. There is so much I can't even get into. Like, this whole era was during what was called the Little Ice Age. So temperatures were colder than usual, and winters were harsher. Many theorized that that was what drove this period to have such conflict. Historian Hugh Trevor Roper even deemed a portion of this the General Crisis because of how many revolts and wars were ongoing in Western Europe. Everything I just said throughout this whole video can be dissected a million ways, so consider anything I said just riddled with asterisks. Like the Thirty Years' War. Sure, it was a conflict driven by religion, but it was primarily politics and noble squabbles. The Ottomans were a constant threat to the Habsburgs, but so were the French. And the French sometimes even allied with the Ottomans to get at Austria. This was an exception to the rule though, everyone hated the French for doing this. The entire point of this video is that I think this era is incredibly underappreciated. And while it's crude to mainly point at the warfare and say, hey, isn't that neat? I know my audience. I know what got you guys into history. Vibes and aesthetics aren't the smartest way to get people interested, but it gets people interested. And at least from an American perspective, it's hilarious. Because while all of this was going on in Europe, for us it was really just this. Or this. Oh damn, I completely forgot to talk about pirates. So, if you're interested in learning more, uh, you know, I've got some sources and channels I think you should check out. Uh, San Roman History is my favorite channel of this era. He has videos that talk about how Spain's military came to be so dominant, how gunpowder transformed the battlefield. He goes into depth on the Thirty Years' War and is probably to blame for why I became so obsessed. Iron Blood is a pretty good non-fiction history on Germany and the HRE in this time period. It's about the rise of Prussia, but it gives a pretty good insight into how the Thirty Years' War was fought, and how warfare in general was thought of during this time. Especially how the average soldier was perceived by a war-weary civilian. And hell, you know, check out Warhammer Fantasy more. It's been pretty overshadowed by 40k. If you want a quick and fun rundown on the whole lore, uh, check out the channel Pancreas No Work. He loves elves, and he hates Bretonia, and his stuff is pretty good. I don't really know why I made this video. I, I just thought it'd be fun. I guess it was really just an excuse to say, I want to shoot a blunderbuss. Like, at least one time in my life. I want to shoot a blunderbuss.
Ugh, I just keep getting these annoying personalized ads. How do they even know that much about me? Well, you see, Jimmy, your privacy is being violated. Yeah, I, I know. You're in my house. How'd you get in my house? No, Jimmy. Thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and trading your personal data without you knowing anything about it. Oh, uh, so what do I do about it? You should use this video sponsor, Incogni. Incogni helps you protect your privacy and take your personal data off the market by reaching out to data brokers on your behalf, requesting your personal data removal, and dealing with their objections. You see, I've been getting random spam calls for months, but once I signed up with Incogni, those calls have practically gone away. Not to mention, I can now search in peace with the peace of mind that my data is going to be well hidden. This is something I would have had to do manually before, tracking everything down on the internet. But now with Incogni, they do it for me. Wow, that's actually quite the time saver. And how. Go to incogni.com slash althist and use the code althist to get an exclusive offer of 60% off. So if I get incogni, does that mean you'll stop using my data to pop by my house? You're kind of like spam yourself, you know. <laughs> well, Jimmy, that's kind of mean. Like, really hurtful, man. I thought we were friends. That's incogni.com slash alt -hist.